if you're anything like me, you have struggled mightily to understand how surfactant works. And you probably read in your textbooks and from your professors that surfactant lowers surface tension, right? But what does that even mean? And how does it actually help your lungs to not deflate and turn into basically a pop balloon? I think I've figured out the best way to understand it. So let's dive right in. Hey everybody, Organized Biology here where we make difficult biology concepts simple. And today we're talking about that pesky molecule surfactant, which does help lower surface tension at your lungs. And I like to remember surfactant starts with the same letters as surface, which is nice, but we don't really know what surface tension is. And even if you do, you don't know really how it works within your lungs. So what we need to do is figure out how we can use the analogy of a balloon, which you may have heard of before, but trust me, this will get better, and how it actually inflates and deflates, but most importantly, how it inflates so easily. So first, we've got an inflated balloon that you just blew air into and you've covered it up with your finger. Now there's gonna be some forces at play, and I apologize for having to talk about physics right now, but it's imperative. So first off, since you blew air molecules into that balloon, there will be a force exerted on the wall of that balloon. And we're just going to call this force P, which is going to stand for that air pressure. And because we love working in hypotheticals, let's give it a specific number. We'll say that P in this case will equal 20. And I'm not going to use units in this video just for the sake of hypotheticals. But you guys know if there's 20 units of pressure pushing out on the balloon, well, wouldn't it inflate because there's nothing else to hold it back? Absolutely. And that's why there's another component to this physics formula, and that's going to be something called wall tension. Okay, now what is wall tension? Well, I want you to think of this balloon as like this rubber band, right? When I pull on the rubber band representing P, that force pushing outward, there's going to be wall tension wanting to push that balloon back towards the center. So this force is due to the balloon and the rubber band's elasticity, or the tendency to want to basically go back to its resting state. And we're going to say this wall tension in this case is going to be 100. Now, whoa, 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 you might be saying, Mr. J, well, if this is 100 and that is 20, shouldn't the balloon deflate? Not so fast. There's actually one more variable we need to talk about in this equation. And I'm going to represent it by this. I thought this was red, but it's brown. My color blindness is showing. I'm going to show it by this red because red stands for the radius of the balloon. And we'll say for this case that R equals 5. So how do all of these values correlate? Well, if you're a smart math geek, not like me, you will see that the wall tension being that 100 is equal to, if we multiply that P being 20, by the radius, which is 5. So obviously, both of our sides of our mathematical formula are satisfied, right? So that's the wall tension calculation. Now, what does this have to do with surfactant and the alveoli? Trust me, here in just a little bit, I'm going to show you a diagram you can see right now that'll be perfectly related to what we're talking about here to understand surfactant. So trust me, we're getting there. I need you, therefore, to look at this number 20 representing that pressure, right? If I were to ask you to blow this balloon up, how much pressure would you have to put on that balloon in order to inflate it? Well, in this case, you would have to put over 20 units of pressure in order to blow up the balloon. Because remember, if this P is 20 here, pushing out, the radius is 5, anything more than 20, and that force is going to be greater than the wall tension, thus inflating the balloon. So we're going to say that putting 20 units of pressure to blow it up is relatively easy. So when you blow up the alveoli in your lungs, you want it to be easy. So remember, we want the P to be small. No, that's not an innuendo, but I realized that after I said it. Moving on, let's say, for example, you want to blow up the balloon when it's already deflated, so basically right out of the bag, and the balloon is very small and deflated. And you guys know this, when you try to inflate this sucker, it is really difficult. Well, why is it difficult to inflate a deflated balloon? Well, that wall tension is still being forced into the center of the balloon, and we're going to say, just for the sake of argument, that it is the same. We're going to say that the wall tension is still equal to 100 because it got that same elasticity to the material. However, in this case, we're going to say the radius has now shifted. And instead of being 5, we're going to say the radius is actually 1. So now, if we plug these values into our calculation, what would our pressure have to be in order to inflate the balloon properly? Well, obviously, we know that number right here should be 100 units of pressure. 
So we would have to put on more than 100 units of pressure in order to inflate the balloon. 100 units versus 20 units? Well, this one is much, much harder to blow up. So if we're thinking of this as our lungs or alveoli, this would actually be really difficult to breathe in because our radius is so small. So all in all, how does surfactant work into these two ideas? Well, let's get to that next. So now that we've established that we want a low pressure to make it really easy to inflate our balloon, now we're gonna translate that to making it really easy to blow up our lungs, or specifically our alveoli, which literally means small air sacs within our lungs. Now we don't wanna use this equation anymore. In fact, we need to use the equation called Laplace's Law, who figured out forces dealing with a spherical structure. And he found out that the air pressure within the alveoli, still going to be represented by P, is equal to a new concept, a new value called T, and more specifically 2T, divided by the radius once again. So the question is obviously, what is T? Because we know what P and R are. Well, T is a new value and it's going to be called surface tension. And paradoxically, surface tension actually goes in the same direction as our P. Now this is going to be kind of paradoxical because it seems like the surface tension is actually helping us inflate our lungs, right? But here's the problem. We want the P to be very low. So how could we adjust our T, right, to lower P? Well, let's give an example just to make it easier. So let's say we want P to be as low as possible. And we're going to compare it to two different scenarios. In one case, we're going to say the surface tension is actually 10. And the other one, we're going to say the surface tension is 2. So obviously, the first one has more surface tension. The bottom one has less surface tension. And the radius, we're going to stay the same at just 1, just to be easy. Which of these scenarios, scenario 1 or scenario 2, would be easier to breathe in? In other words, which one would have the lowest P? Well, obviously, if you do the equation, you've got 2 times 10 over 1. That's going to be a pressure of 20. And in the second case, we've got 2 times 2 over 1, which is actually a pressure of 4. So if you answer number 2 would be easier, you would be correct. So therefore, do we want the surface tension to be high or low? We want the surface tension to be low. This should ring a bell in your mind, right? Because surfactant lowers the surface tension. Ding! <laughs> so we're getting somewhere. And if this has been helpful so far, please like this video, subscribe to the channel, I'll make a lot more videos making difficult concepts like this easy for you. So we've mentioned that surface tension needs to be low, but we haven't discussed what it actually is quite yet, have we? So let's get into that. Well, surface tension is actually produced, and there's water actually lining this alveoli, and I'm just realizing that pink is going to be my color of water in this case. And that water lining is actually going to exert a force pushing outward on the alveoli. But again, we need to lower it. Okay, but how is water exerting a force inside a gas-like structure like your alveoli? Well, let's zoom in specifically on this section right here. And let's actually see what's going on in here to produce our surface tension. Okay, so this is my poorly drawn diagram of the inner lining of your alveoli. So here's the alveolar cells, simple squamous, allowing that diffusion. Then there's going to be a thin layer of water, just a few molecules thick. But here's what's going on here. You can see the water's kind of not organized in kind of a beautiful, perfect manner, right? And that's because water actually exerts forces on neighboring water molecules. Now, why is that? Well, we know water is just going to be represented by the circle. But in reality, water is H-O-H, -H, right? Two atoms of hydrogen connected to a central oxygen. And we know that oxygen is really, really uh, selfish and likes to hold on to electrons closer to itself. So we actually make this oxygen slightly negative because there's electrons are hanging out closer to the oxygen. That makes that end of the molecule a little negative. Whereas the hydrogen ions lose some of those electrons, not fully, but partially, so they actually become slightly positive. And that's what we call a polar molecule, right? Separation of charge. So if another water molecule comes around and hangs out with it, it will actually hang out like this. Because the slightly negative oxygen will want to associate with the slightly positive hydrogen of the other water. So we will see this tension of force, because opposites attract, 
pulling the hydrogen of one and the oxygen of the other close to itself. But that's called a hydrogen bond, this intramolecular bond, kind of pulling, tugging the water molecules together. So anywhere there's multiple water molecules, they're all kind of pulling towards each other in a sense. But here's the thing. These water molecules, right, where are the forces pulling them? So in other words, are any other water molecules exerting a force on them? Well, absolutely. We've got one neighboring it. We've got one below it. We'll likely have one kind of on the edge here. And then we've got one above it, right? And same thing for the next one. And so forth and so on. So interestingly, these water molecules like to chill where they're at because they're getting pulled sideways, they're getting pulled up and down, so they are content just chilling where they're at. But there's a problem. The ones above them, right, they're going to be kind of tugged at side to side, right, because they're right next to each other. So they're content in terms of a horizontal scale. But is something pulling on them above? No, there's no force pulling them upward because these water molecules don't exist, obviously. So in other words, the only place these guys want to go is actually downward. So because there's only a net force acting downward on these water molecules, well, think about it. That's a force, right? There's a force pushing these water molecules downward, right? What is that exactly similar to? Surface tension, right? So this is what creates our surface tension. This tendency of the water molecules to want to dive deep and push outward like that. And remember, that's bad because the more surface tension we have, the more pressure we have to use to get air into our lungs. So we want to decrease the surface tension. How do we do it? Surfactant. So I'm going to draw a molecule of surfactant and it's going to blow your mind. Not really. It just looks kind of like a squid. So here's our molecule of surfactant. And what I want you to key in on is the two ends of the surfactant molecule. On this end, you can see I drew it in pink because it's polar aspect of the molecule. So just like water, it's got that separation of charge of positive and negative, And that means it can associate with water molecules. Then we've got this section that's actually going to be called hydrophobic or nonpolar. And we know from this video that I've made previously that nonpolar things do not associate with polar things. In fact, they are considered hydrophobic, which means they're afraid of water, right? So they don't want to be anywhere near water in this black section, whereas the pink section likes to be with water. Okay, so what would that look like? Well, let me change all of these intermingled water molecules, and I'm going to turn them into surfactant molecules. Okay, so why are they on that top layer? Well, remember, these fatty parts of the tail, the hydrophobic part, does not like to be with water. So no matter where surfactant is in here, it's always going to flip its tails up and move up to the surface, okay? Very similar to if you pour oil into water, the oil kind of floats to the surface, right? Because it doesn't like the water. So in essence, there is a little bit of a force pulling these tails upward away from that water because they're hydrophobic, right? They're forcing away from the water. But then we've also got the water molecules that are still attracted to the surfactant molecules horizontally because they're attracted to the polar end of the surfactant, right? So they can associate with it. But if they are attracted to these surfactant molecules that are getting pulled up, what happens to these arrows that are causing the surface tension? Well, these arrows actually get smaller. Now that might be a complex concept for you. So instead, think of this analogy. Let's say this surfactant is a lifeguard with one of their flotation devices. And we'll say that the water right here is like a drowning person in the middle of the ocean. So the drowning person is obviously going to go under. They can't keep themselves above the water. But they will likely grab a hold of the lifeguard. And that lifeguard with the floaty will help to keep them on the top or the surface of the water and thus pull them ever so slightly upward, preventing them from having too much of a pull downward. 
So surfactant is just like a lifeguard helping the water molecules from drowning, thus causing that surface tension. So all in all, if surfactant helps pull the water this way, we decrease that surface tension, thus decreasing our pressure, thus making it easier, easier? <laughs> thus making it easier to inflate the balloons we call our alveoli.